Before I get into the Bible background, first of all, welcome Peg Fobb back. She's back from her sojourn in New Zealand. So welcome back, Peg. She and her husband thought when they were going down to see their daughter back around March 20th of 2020, maybe it would be smart to leave a week early. And it was. <laughs> and you've been down there ever since, except now. I'm so glad you're back. And she slipped me a note that said, would you announce there is an open house this afternoon at Bilal Mosque, 4 o'clock. So there you go. Those are always interesting and just great feel-good events. Good way to get to know our neighbors. All right, in way of the Bible background, have any of you ever read the book of Revelation? Whoa. All right, in way of the Bible background, have any of you ever read the book of Revelation? Whoa, quite a few of you. Do any of you understand it? Oh, I was going to switch places with you. What did you think? Just shout it out. Scary. Scary. Like, a story. like a horror story. Historic. Symbolism. I heard something like amusing. Did I hear that right? Confusing. All right. <laughs> Confusing. Anything else? My personal feeling is though it contains some helpful and some hopeful things, it has caused so much misery, I would happily remove it from every Bible in the land. The Protestant reformer Martin Luther wrote about Revelation, I can in no way detect that the Holy Spirit produced it. And he also wrote, let everyone think of it as his own spirit leads him, my spirit cannot accommodate itself to this book. For me, this is reason enough not to think highly of it. Christ is neither taught nor known in it. Well, say what you think, Martin. <laughs> we'll come back to that last part. But since we cannot remove it, and since we should not ignore it, I want to share four quick things before we hear the reading, which might increase your understanding of it. Number one. The book was written by someone named John, but it is not the same John who wrote the Gospel of John. This John had gotten crosswise with the Roman authorities, and he was exiled to the sparsely inhabited Isle of Patmos, which is just off the coast of Turkey. He writes that, while in the spirit on the Lord's day, he had a vision, and he heard a loud voice urging him to write down what he saw, and he said it to the seven churches on the mainland. He believed the voice was the voice, the very voice of Christ. And for reasons you'll thank me for not getting into, scholars believe this was around 95 AD, we call it CE now, more or less. Now most of the Gospels were written around that time, this is point two, which means they were written two to three decades after the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. Imagine writing about American society or politics today without taking into account the Civil War or 9-11. And no, multiply that by a factor of, say, a zillion. I'm using that word a lot today. It feels good. So we don't talk about that enough, and that's on me. But here's what happened. In the year 66, the Jewish people led a revolt against the Romans, and they themselves took back control and occupied Jerusalem. And that initiated the first Jewish-Roman War. After three years of that war, the Romans brought catapults, siege towers, and battering rams to Jerusalem. They laid a heavy siege against the city that caused hunger and thirst and disease. It raged through the city. And about six months later, the Romans broke through the walls, leaving only that western wall, which people still pray at today. They tore down and burnt the temple, most of Jerusalem, completely to the ground. How bad was it for the Jewish people? The historian Josephus tells us numbers that just astound. 
A recent Christian Century article says, 3,000 died this day, 20,000 that day, and on and on. Tens of thousands were thrown over or leaped over the city walls into ravines. Those who survived were taken into slavery. It was nothing short of apocalyptic. It's something of a miracle that the Jewish people survived at all. And it's with those events in very recent memory that the Gospels in the book of Revelation were written. Remember that when you read them. All right, number three. The book is officially called the Apocalypse of John. Apocalypse is a Greek word for unveiling or revelation. That's why we call it the book of Revelation. And it's structured like nesting Russian dolls. It opens with seven letters written to seven churches. And then, then they're opening a series of seven seals. You get to the sixth seal. Things are looking really hopeless. You get to the seventh seal and you find that the seventh seal is actually seven trumpets. And you go through the seven trumpets. And then there's seven something else and something else. And you go deeper and deeper and deeper, cycling into the story, unveiling more and more. But to add to your confusion, it's not only an unveiling, but a veiling. Somebody said it's very symbolic. It's a particular kind of literature called apocalyptic writing. And this isn't the only apocalyptic writing we have. There's pieces of it in Mark, in Luke, in Daniel, elsewhere, and, and beyond the Bible as well. Apocalyptic writing usually arises in times of crisis. So for instance, during the days of apartheid in South Africa, Black preachers could not mention the name of the president, but they could talk about the Antichrist, and they did, and everybody knew who they were talking about. I heard Desmond Tutu preach in Nicaragua during the wars there in the 1980s. He never mentioned a country or a political leader by name, but he preached the story of the Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace and how they survived and who was with them. And we all knew who the boys were. We all knew what the furnace was. We all knew just who was stoking that furnace. But he didn't have to name them. So be very worried if we ever get to the point in this nation where your preacher has to resort to using apocalyptic metaphor and coding from the pulpit. Just saying. All right, congratulations. You have survived a four-part introduction to the book of Revelation. Today's reading comes from the next to last chapter of the book. If you have read as far as chapter 20, you have endured battle after battle after battle between the powers of good and evil. The reading that I also added from chapter 19, you can read at your leisure, is a good example. Anyway, you've endured all these battles and all this evil, you're getting to the end, and you must be wondering who's going to come out on top? And don't forget, as you hear this, how acutely the people are mourning their horrendous losses and the ruination of Jerusalem. Allison? All right, I am reading from the New Revised Standard Version Updated Edition. I was asked to let you know that. This is uh, from the book of Revelation, chapter 21. 1 through 8, the new heaven and the new earth. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among the mortals, he will dwell with them. They will be his peoples. And God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, 
the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. To those who conquer will inherit these things, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. But, but as for those, the cowardly, the faithless, the polluted, the murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all the liars, their place will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. I think we'd better pray. Beloved God, more than ever after a reading like that, we ask that you open our eyes, our ears, and our imaginations. Open our spirits that your spirit may speak to and through ours, and we may come away with new understanding, maybe a new insight or two that will draw us closer to you. Amen. Well, with each new disaster on the national and world scene, friends nervously joke with me, and so do many of you. Is this it? Is this the biblically predicted end of days? And my answer is always no and no, just to get that out of the way. Not because we're not in a world of hurt, but because the very idea of apocalypse and end of the world are a misunderstanding of this very complicated book called Revelation. Like Martin Luther, I fervently wish it had never been included in the Bible, but it has, and so we must deal with it, or it is going to continue to haunt and frighten us at every turn. The most frightening way to read Revelation is to try to read it literally, you drop into a strange and troubling world of sea beasts and dragons, false prophets, plagues, wars, famine, death and more death, final judgment, seas of fire and more. If you think Revelation was written to foretell events happening in our time, then you'll spend your energies trying to jiggle together puzzle pieces, ill-fitting puzzle pieces. And people are doing just that today. A quick internet search shows that many Christians are claiming that the eagle in Revelation 8 represents the United States. The bear in 19, of course, represents Russia. And the dragon, which appears throughout the book, must be China. But Revelation was not written to address specific issues of our time, although our egos would love to tell us that it was. It just isn't. It just wasn't. Revelation was written in apocalyptic code to help people bear up to persecution in the Roman Empire, whose military symbol, by the way, was what? An eagle. Do you suppose it's more likely Revelation's writer was thinking about the Roman eagle or the eagle of a country that wouldn't even exist for another 1,700 years? Revelation was also written to give hope to people who had lived through the horrors of the siege and destruction of Jerusalem. And following that, enslavement in the Roman Empire. Didn't, didn't your ears hear that text a little bit different, knowing how they had suffered in Jerusalem, to hear about the new Jerusalem and the springs of living water when they had been without water in the siege? Anyway, it was not written to address specific issues in our time. Don't go down that road. It's a road filled with error and confusion and fear. I know something about that fear. I was 17 years old. I had a crush on a born-again Christian. Here, he said, read this. And he handed me a copy of The Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey. That book was one of the best sellers of the decade with its terrifying portrayal of the end of the world, a fiery Armageddon, the rapture the second of, of, of Christians, up in the air when Christ came again, and then the final judgment day in the lake of fire and all of that. If I remember right, the book had it worked out that this was going to start in the fall of 1973, exactly when I was reading it. 
That October, war broke out between Israel, Egypt, and Syria. Worse yet, for several days, the Strategic Air Command went on full high alert. Very unusual for them. I was young. I was terrified. This was it. Our numbers up. And I wasn't all that confident that I was a faithful enough soul to get to go with Jesus, as the book had outlined. And that meant I'd either be hanging around for the nuclear holocaust or whatever horrible scenario waited around the corner, or maybe I'd be spending eternity in a fiery lake of sulfur. I really was scared. It was awful. The news itself was frightening enough for anybody paying attention, but it was made so much worse with, that, with all those apocalyptic visions of end times filling my head. A footnote to that story, not too many years ago I learned that the high alert of the Strategic Air Command was fabricated in order to keep some particularly damaging Watergate news off the front page. Well, Revelation was not written to specifically address issues of our day, but I think it's helpful to consider why people might read it that way. So for the next several minutes, I'm going to talk about my ideas, why I think people do. First, I think it's natural to want things to end happily. The Bible begins in the Garden of Bliss and Innocence, and it ends in Revelation with a new heaven, a new earth, a new and better Jerusalem descending from on high, walls built of jasper, streets made of pure gold, each city gate an enormous pearl. The gates never shut, and yet nothing impure ever enters, and there is no night at all. You don't need lights because light just radiates out from God and Christ who are in the center of the city. And isn't this the new Jerusalem you might dream of if you had been through the siege of the old one? It's natural to want a joyful ending. And secondly, I think it's natural to want to be rescued in order to get there. It makes sense for somebody to return us to better days or to take us to an ideal future or past. We're seeing it all around us in this country, aren't we? In Jesus' time, people wanted to return to the country the way it had been or they thought it had been under King David. They wanted a Messiah who would be their new, even better than David kind of king. And Jesus turned into a different kind of Messiah, teaching about the kingdom of God, not as a, a pie-in-the-sky world, but as a reality here and now, with us and among us, but one we would collectively live into and love into and pray and struggle our way into, not one that was created by a magical, better king than ever, King David. Well, after Jesus' death, it didn't take long before the old dreams of a magical rescuer came back. And some of his followers began to distort his memory into that mold. It was like they were saying, okay, so he didn't boot out the Romans and start up a new kingdom the first time. But just wait, he'll be back. And then he's really going to kick some Romans. And so we have a few biblical stories of Jesus returning a second time when he will carry believers into heaven with him and bust out all kinds of grief and misery on those left behind. This idea still captures people's imagination, and a lot of churches are specifically preaching against the idea of a, a weak, compassionate Jesus who taught things like love of enemies. They say we need a muscular Jesus who will deal out some punishment where deserved. The Jesus, as Allison read, who will give to the saved the water from the springs of eternal life, and all the rest, the muscular Jesus will throw into the lake of fire and sulfur. We want to be rescued. We want to get our joyful ending. And thirdly, it's natural for us to yearn for a better place when our own place gets to be so difficult and miserable. Someone just last week pointed, or thanked me for recently pointing out that in the UCC, we tend to worry more about getting heaven into us than about getting ourselves into heaven. More about getting heaven into us than getting ourselves into heaven. And I hope that's true. But it does get confusing. 
In Luke and Acts, Jesus taught about the kingdom of God, about a new way of being in the world, in an egalitarian community marked by love and peace and justice. And that's a collaborative community, he said. And we're the collaborators with the Spirit of God working in us and through us and among us. And I could get into that kind of community, couldn't you? But the Gospel of Matthew teaches the same sort of thing, but he's using the language of the kingdom of heaven rather than the kingdom of God. Why is that? Because it was written to a Jewish audience, and Jews did not say the word God out loud. So they changed up that concept of a collaborative, peace and justice filled kingdom to the kingdom of heaven. And no wonder people get the impression that Jesus wasn't teaching about the here and now, but was teaching about the great by and by, about a heavenly pie in the sky. Then the Gospel of John confuses us even more, translating kingdom of God as eternal life. And so the dynamic teachings of Jesus about a new way of life, a new spirit of love in the here and now, turns into a religion about life after death, judgment and reward, lakes of fire below, and crystal cities descending from above. And since it's natural to want a joyous and tidy ending, to want a rescuer to take us there, it's natural to yearn for a better place. And it's no wonder so many people wait for Jesus' second coming to set things right finally and give us deserving folk our heavenly reward. But also remember these pseudo-literal readings of Revelation are very frightening. Now, if you're worried that I've got this wrong, and that's always a possibility, that the biblical end of the world is right around the corner, take comfort that any literal reading of Revelation tells us that the Jerusalem temple has to be rebuilt before Jesus returns. Old story about my grandma. Apparently every few years, people would come through town and present these big programs about the end of the world and Jesus' second coming, and she would get herself all fussed up. She'd finally settle down and say, well, I guess I won't pack my bags until they rebuild that temple. And while we're on the topic of fear, don't forget that fear is an excellent way to control people. It now seems a long time ago, but way back in 2007, Naomi Klein wrote an article called Fascist America in 10 Steps. The first step, she said, was invoke a terrifying internal and external enemy. So let's be careful of what we're frightened of, lest we fall into somebody's grab for power and control. Now, you might be frightened anyway, and with good reason if you're keeping up on the news. And paradoxically, you can find comfort in the book of Revelation. If you read it, understanding that the events are symbolic, they're mostly aimed at first century Rome, though they are convenient for people through the ages to use against oppressors in any circumstance. In seminary, I got to hear the book of Revelation read as a reader's theater, all in one setting one night. What an experience. I learned that night that the book of Revelation is profoundly hopeful. Who'd thunk it? Over and over, John shapes the stories and symbols to overcome the chasm between reality and hope. Through cycle after cycle after cycle, he assures the faithful that God will come through, good will always triumph over evil, and our hope will not be disappointed. Truth and justice and goodness triumph throughout the book and ultimately not to give things away, but I will, ultimately triumph in the end when all things come together and God reshapes the whole social world and, in fact, all of creation. Now, as I shared with the children, I think of Jesus' second coming, at least the first one, the first second coming, there we go, as the time he returned from the resurrection and spent time with his disciples, teaching them more about the kingdom of God telling them that the Spirit of God would come to help them be as witnesses through the world. 
And a powerful witness it was as those disciples went on to form communities where they shared everything they had, where they cared for the weakest among them, they sang and prayed and celebrated together at every common meal. What a wonderful community that would be. And it's our call still today to live in the Spirit, to live out those dynamic teachings of Jesus about a new way of life, a new spirit of love and joy and justice that permeates the here and now. A reality which we can build together collaboratively, caring for one another and building for one another and praying and singing and celebrating together and moving that love and energy and justice out into the community and world. It is such a better witness to Jesus' dream of God, I think, than waiting for him to reappear in the sky and set our world right for us. Especially when we have been given all we need and the Spirit of God to boot to work together to set the world right. There's an old story about a state legislature in colonial New England whose members went into a panic as a total solar eclipse unexpectedly began. I don't know if it's true, but it ought to be. Anyway, the sun was blotted out, the sky blackened. What else could it be besides the second coming? When a motion was made to adjourn, one legislature, legislator is remembered to have said, Mr. Speaker, if it is not the end of the world and we adjourn, we shall appear to be fools. If it is the end of the world, I choose to be found doing my duty. I move you, sir, let candles be brought. I am quite confident that Christ is not appearing in a second coming, but has already come again and again and again and again via the Spirit of God at Pentecost, and every time two or three are gathered together, and when the Spirit moves us when we are alone. Today, we observe All Saints Sunday, particularly honoring the saints of our lives in this church who have died in the past year. And I think we honor them best when we build on their work, continuing to build a community of love and justice and service. And when we see hum someone hungry, feed them. When we know of someone thirsty, give them drink. When we know of someone in the hospital or in prison, we visit them. That's how we'll see the face of Christ. That's the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus taught us to live and witness. We don't need to wait for that kingdom for Jesus to usher it in. He's here among us now, urging us to collaborate with him together so the kingdom can be among us as well, as it has been for so many who went before us, and as I pray it will be for the long line coming after us. Amen. Let's sing together a hymn I just love to sing on All Saints Day, written by, I do believe this hymn writer was a member of the church you wound up working in, Peg. Shirley Murray? Yes, yes. A Small World. <laughs> 